All righty. Um, welcome back for our uh, final panel of, of, of the day. Um, I'm Professor Jonathan Adler here at, at Case Western. I'm going to very briefly introduce our final panelists. Uh, their full bios are, are in the CLE booklet. Um, but first, we are going to be hearing uh, from Robin Fretwell Wilson, who is the Roger and, St and Stevie Jocelyn Professor of Law and Director of the Family Law and Policy Program at the University of Illinois College of Law. Uh, then we will be uh, hearing from Professor Ernest Young, the Alston and Bird Professor of Law at Duke University School of Law. Uh, and then finally, we'll be hearing from my colleague, uh, Professor Leon Gabinet, the Coleman P. Burke Professor of Law here at Case Western. Uh, but you didn't come here to see me, so I will uh, turn it over to Robin uh, for her remarks. Thank you. I just wanted to first say to the Law Review, what a good job you guys have done. So, yeah. So I want to argue and maybe hopefully convince you today that same-sex marriage recognition is necessarily yoked to religious liberty protections, but that's going to be in the near term. And that we are, in fact, at a critical moment in the same-sex marriage movement, especially for opponents. Public support for same-sex marriage and opposition to it are nearly an equipoise. That's not good. Okay. Um, and I'll show you this in just a second. But they're basically an equipoise, and they're likely to be as close to equipoise now as they're going to be in coming years. And it's that equipoise that puts marriage opponents and religious liberty advocates in the strongest possible position to secure religious liberty protections. But the price tag for those protections today is going to be the compromise on same-sex marriage. So let me say that another way. If you want to protect religious objectors from the fallout of same-sex marriage, you better act now because the window is closing. Now, why do I think the window is closing? So this map shows 2008 support for same-sex marriage in blue and opposition in red with the strongest uh, support and the strongest opposition in the deepest colors. And it's drawn from a regression analysis that Nate Silver did in 2000, of 2008 polling data in three states that he then extrapolated to the rest of the country. Now, Silver is a political scientist, some of you will know, whose modeling is um, unique in having accurately predicted that California's Prop 8 would actually succeed at the ballot box when others thought, thought that it would not. Now, these maps going forward actually use Silver's projections for 2012, for 2016, and for 2020. And as you can see, blue just washes across the country. Now, it may be that Silver is wrong about these projections or the extrapolations, but it certainly fits with other things that we know. Public opinion over six years, as you can see here, just the slice has become more supportive overall, the dark green line. And then a majority finally supported same-sex marriage across the nation in 2010. And matters are only likely to get worse for same-sex marriage opponents. So Pew, Gallup, Silver, and others have all documented a generational divide over same-sex marriage. You might have seen the Wall Street Journal this week, which uh, reported on something else, but also documented that this generational divide is true even for young evangelicals. So why do you have this increased acceptance? I think roughly half of that change, Silver says, comes from generational change, but the other half comes from changing attitudes towards same-sex marriage, both for young and old alike. And that's softening maybe because some of the things we've heard about Today, familiarity with lesbian and gay couples and parenting, having gay family members yourself. But there has also been a distinct decline in the view that same-sex marriage will, quote, change society for the worst. Now, opponents could afford to ignore this phenomena phenomenon of a generational divide if it was localized. But it shows up in every single state, according to Lax and Phillips, who distilled actual polling numbers from 94 to 2008 and then weighted them towards 2008. You see the 65 and older are shown in the light blue X's on the far left of the support scale. And when you include them, you can see on the right-hand side that only seven states in 2009 had a majority that supported same-sex marriage. Now, this swing towards embracing same-sex marriage is only going to accelerate as the oldest die off. And I'll show you that here, right, where we re-averaged um, basically without the silent generation and after they pass on, you'll have support in over up that exceeds 50% in over 17 states um, in nine, 45% or more, which is going to put them in striking distance of same-sex marriage. So you'll see a fair number of those actually supporting same-sex marriage are being in striking distance. 
Now, given all of this, I think the message, the clear message, is that you need to strike while you can, securing as much religious liberty protections at the bargaining table as you can get today, or you could move to Mississippi. Okay. <laughs> now, I'm not alone, I don't think, in believing that same-sex marriage recognition is inevitable. So today, an increasing number of opponents and supporters alike see it as inevitable, as this data from Pew shows. And this extends, interestingly enough, even to those that you might predict are the most hardened against same-sex marriage, apologize about the same small numbers. The left hand or first column is the percent that favor same-sex marriage. The second column is the ones that think that it's inevitable. And these categories are people like Republicans and white evangelicals and others that we generally think of as opposing same-sex marriage who still believe it's inevitable. Now, you could say all of these people are just wrong, that they're misgaging opposition, and that they rush to the judgment, therefore, that the game is over. But we know from other data that when people misjudge public support, they tend to see, quote, most Americans as coming down on the side of not legalizing it. In other words, opponents tend to see themselves as in a majority. So that cannot explain the sense of inevitability. OK, so where does that leave you? If you're the diehard opponent of same-sex marriage, what do you do in the face of these trends? So I think you do what someone uh, said to me after losing Washington's same-sex marriage fight, someone who opposed it on the merits, said that opponents need to fall back to the second barricade, meaning that they should now work to secure as much well-defined religious liberty protections as they can. Now, whether to fight at the first barricades or the second barricades, I think, is that crossroad moment that opponents in particular are at right now. People like Rod Dreher recently have said that they think that a consensus is emerging on the right, that the most important goal is, in fact, to be at that second barricade, securing religious liberty today while there's still a time. Now, I think many people in this room probably would think that Dreher is uh, premature, about a consensus at least. Uh, and I think one of the reasons that he may be premature is that people who still are manning the first barricades believe that, those, that their focus should still stay there. And I want to talk about or organize the rest of my talk around why the first barricade arguments don't work out. So I'll come back to that in a second. But before I proceed, let me just talk about how explanatory all of these trends really are. So until 2012, same-sex marriage opponents had won, quote unquote, won 29 consecutive constitutional amendment fights, putting aside Arizona's failed 06 constitutional amendment, which tried to ban same-sex marriage and civil unions. So I think it's sort of uh, different in kind. So that streak abruptly ended in 2012 when they lost a referendum over Washington. They lost a referendum over Maryland. They failed to secure a constitutional amendment for the first time in Minnesota, and Maine voters enacted same-sex marriage at the ballot box. And all of this after you see the tide of public opinion having shifted. Okay, so now to the critics. Critics like Matt Frank and others say that bargaining for religious liberty protections have gotten exactly nowhere. They say, in particular, that they do little to protect persons or groups. Now, here's the map for where we are with same-sex marriage uh, today. And at least as to groups, this appraisal is just wrong as to the jurisdictions that actually enacted legislation or voted same-sex marriage in by popular ballot, like Maine did. So there are, in fact, four jurisdictions where there are exactly no protections. These black hole states all resulted when same-sex marriage was recognized by a judicial decision alone, and the legislature did not follow up with the sensible state law. Notice that Connecticut, however, is in green, right? There is no rule that says when there's a state decision like Kerrigan that you can't, in fact, follow on the heels of it with a sensible law. Now, in contrast to those black hole states, all 12 jurisdictions to enact same-sex marriage by legislation or through popular ballot have, in fact, included meaningful even if they're imperfect, religious liberty protections. In fact, what we see is a core of protections emerging for religious organizations and individuals who, for uh, religious reasons, cannot facilitate any marriage, whether it's a same-sex marriage, interfaith marriage, second marriage, whatever. And although each of these laws describe the exempt activities in slightly different ways, 10 of them say to religiously affiliated groups, you don't have to provide services, accommodations, advantages, facilities, or as Maine fashions it, you can refuse to, quote, host any marriage. Ten jurisdictions shield objectors from private suit for such refusal. Ten say they can't be government, uh, penalized by the government for that. 
Now, why do I talk about the government? Because groups like the Salvation Army have in fact been penalized by the government. The Salvation Army lost three and a half million dollars in social services contracts with the, social, uh, the city of San Francisco when it refused on religious grounds to provide benefits to its employees' same-sex partner. Now, in addition to this core of protections, we also see what I call an a la carte menu that some states include, but other states do not. Three jurisdictions give a pass to the Knights of Columbus. They can still <laughs> sear, you know, sell this weird insurance product that they have where they want to cover only heterosexual spouses. Five of them say religious organizations don't have to promote same-sex marriage through religious counseling. Think the Baptist marriage retreat. The Baptists can just continue to do this with other Baptists. Three extend protection to married couples um, in terms of housing, for example, and say you don't have to promote same-sex marriage through marriage uh, married couple housing. Three jurisdictions allow a religiously affiliated adoption agency to continue to place children only with heterosexual married couples. Quid pro quo, can't take any federal or any government money, but you can at least do this. And then three states expressly exempt individual employees of a covered entity from having to celebrate a same-sex marriage or any marriage. It's kind of hard to figure out who this is, but think about the renegade Unitarian who doesn't actually want to perform a same-sex marriage that the church is fine with doing. That person gets a pass. And then one state, remarkably Delaware, allows a sitting justice of the peace or a judge to refuse to marry any couple when doing so would violate her religious beliefs and she doesn't have to actually leave her job as we heard earlier today, or potentially be disciplined. Now all of that sweeps beyond the church sanctuary. And importantly, with two exceptions, these protections came on the heels of attempts to enact same-sex marriage without religious liberty protections for anyone other than the clergy, what I call a fake religious liberty exemption because the First Amendment already provides that. So here I'm gonna use Maryland as an example. You can see on this timeline in 08 and 09, uh, crappy bills with clergy-only exemptions were introduced and they both died. Okay, Maryland illustrates another profound point over time. In every single case, with the exception of Delaware, the bill's protections that finally were approved morphed over the course of back and forth negotiation between both sides. So for example, in 2011, the Maryland House again introduced a crappy clergy only exemption and they sent it across to the Senate, which enlarged those protections, but not enough to ultimately satisfy holdout legislators in the House and it died. So what happens in 2012? Governor O'Malley enters the picture, adds more protections, especially in this case for religious adoption social services agencies, in a conscious attempt, uh, as the Washington Post would say, to pick up additional support in the House. It does, and the Maryland House narrowly passes it, the Senate narrowly passes it, and it survives a referendum narrowly. Now later, Speaker Bush, in interviews with my co-author for another piece, said that he knows for a fact that two or three delegates voted for the bill because of religious liberty protections. Now before moving on, let me, hope what, let me talk about what I hope is actually a new trend, which was Delaware's pr protection for individuals who operate in the world, not within the confines of a religious organization. Delaware's code, which you see on the bottom, includes among authorized celebrants, justices of the peace, magistrates, and others like judges. And the same-sex marriage law, which you see at the top, explicitly says nothing shall require any person to do one of those celebrations. Now until Delaware, no jurisdiction had provided this kind of protection to sitting government officials. Where protections were lacking, like they are in the black hole states of Massachusetts and Iowa, justices of the peace were told you better follow the law whether you like it or not. And you could, by the way, have to pay a civil sanction up to $50,000 under Massachusetts law. The Iowa AG told county recorders, follow the law or face legal action like discipline or firing. And judges were told, yeah, you've got some discretion, but you better not use it in a biased way, right? So those are all pretty significant sanctions. And not only do you need protections for people in the world like judges and government employees, but you need it for wedding professionals. We've already heard some of that today, but I just show you one case here, Arlene Flowers in Washington, who now, or the group or the entity now faces lawsuits not only from the state attorney general, but from a couple uh, that it refused to serve. Um, and the owner had in fact provided, had a relationship for a decade with this couple, said that it could not do the, the couple's wedding uh, flowers because of the owner's quote, relationship with Jesus Christ. Now Dreer and others predict that if religious objectors are in fact seen as intolerant going forward, that they quote, may well find little asylum outside the walls of their churches. 
And I think that's actually a fair appraisal of where religious liberty accommodations stand today. The exemptions have so far netted out largely to big religion, not to individuals. And in so doing, they have carved the world, balkanized it into private religious spaces and everything else. And that, I think, is unacceptable to many people. Now, in every state, this brings me to the claim that some make, uh, may be making or some worry that the fact that you're only getting exemptions is because, in, because the, the vote counts were so narrow. And you can see that they were very close vote counts in every state, even though, with the exception of Minnesota, there was more than 50% popular support for the law at the time that it passed. And here's the point that I had. Religious liberty protections may in fact not have been forthcoming if there had been wildly more support for same-sex marriage in the state at that time. And we know that because people like Lucy Larique, who's a Vermont House of Representatives uh, assistant leader who took the lead with that legislation of Vermont, said so. She said, if we could have done this law without exemptions, we would have. And that's my point today, that your bargaining power is at its zenith during moments of equipoise before public opinion swamps everything else. Now, other legislators you can see below, like Heidi Sherman, actually had a different take. For them, the religious liberty protections invents respect for both sides and ensure that religious objectors can live out their religious lives. Now, all of that so far brings us to the crux of concern, which is basically that these exemptions are alleged to have provided cover for cowardly legislators who would never have voted for these bills but for that exemption. That's the claim. So the question is, were you going to have this law anyhow? And I'm going to argue that you would have had this law anyhow, if not that year, then in a handful of years. And why do I believe that? I believe that because the same-sex marriage movement has followed a tried and true pattern across the enacting jurisdictions. They have targeted states that share a certain, impact, a certain set of characteristics at the time that they move forward. So we already know that with the exception of Minnesota, there was majority support for same-sex marriage in every one of these states. Every state had a non-discrimination guarantee in place for housing, employment, or public accommodations, as you can see here. We also know that Democrats tend to support same-sex marriage in huge numbers. How does that tie up here? Well, it turns out that every enacting jurisdiction had Democratic control in both houses with the exception of New York's Republican Senate. Likewise, every state had a Democratic governor with the exception of two. Let me talk about those. Kerrigan, where the Republican governor had no choice, right, in Connecticut. Um, <coughs> and then you have in <coughs> Vermont the Republican governor actually being overridden by the legislature. Now, we also know that religious affiliation or a lack of it matters to same-sex marriage support. So it's remarkable then that every one of the enacting jurisdictions ranks among the lowest third in religiosity in the United States with the exception of three that hover just above the bottom third. Finally, we know that college educated people tend to favor same-sex marriage and all of these states in fact had uh, fall in the top third for an educated populace. Now, if existing exemptions don't go far enough, and I believe they don't, why bother? And I think the answer here is that advocates have already run out their hand in terms of the existing easy terrain, and they're about to enter much more difficult political terrain. Why do I say that? Well, because they are going to hit Republican-controlled houses, as you can see here, almost everywhere. They're going to hit Republican governors almost everywhere. They're going to hit more religious con constituencies, constituencies. Now, here you have the most religious shown in red, and you have mid-level shown in purple, but that's most of the country. They're going to hit populations where more people have less formal education, and they're going to hit deeper public opposition, at least based on Nate Silver's 2012 projections. And here you see that areas with support below 39% are shown in the darkest red, below 50 in salmon. Um, but as you can see, the map is awash in red and pink. And same-sex marriage advocates will not have a promise of uh, non-discrimination working for them in these jurisdictions because only a handful of states remaining actually do that. Nearly all of the remaining states do have state constitution amend constitutional amendments that already ban same-sex marriage. So you might say, why bargain then? And I think the answer is that these are not locked in stone. In fact, when you code them, and I won't go into this in too much detail, about a third, 10, 
um, actually do have a strong lock in effect, meaning that you need two thirds of the legislature or majority of voters to amend it. But another uh, 14 exert only a mild lock in effect requiring a majority of legislators and a majority of voters. And then these final ones exert almost no effect at all. You need some signatures and a majority of the population. So overall, the 29 constitutional amendment states don't present nearly the barricade to change that many people might want to assume they do. But more importantly, support has been growing for same-sex marriage even in these states. So by 2020, virtually every state will have sufficient support to enact same-sex marriage, so much so that the religious liberty exemptions would not be a necessary sweetener. Now, of course, you have to lay over that the strong lock in effect states, right, where there is a higher threshold to change. But still, it's, um, it's going to be a tough row to hoe. So let me leave you. I'm going to skip this idea that exemptions will be rolled back. I'm going to tell you that they haven't been. That's not our history with abortion conscience clauses. It's not our history with the Miss Murphy exemption to the Fair Housing Act. And I'll leave you just with this one idea from New Jersey, where, as you know, people started marrying this week, right? Why? Because Governor Christie dropped his appeal of the recent same-sex marriage decision. And that teed up the question about whether the legislature should, in fact, override Christie's veto of the same-sex marriage bill last year, which had a slim religious liberty exemption for institutions in it. And here, Reed uh, Gasoria says uh, he thinks that even the most conservative members of the legislature would want to ensure that that exemption was there, uh, and they should have voted for it the first time, and they may find themselves on the wrong side of history. Now, of course, knowing that you might wind up on the wrong side of history can be a great mar motivator and spark compromise. I actually hope that it will. But barring that, well, there's always Mississippi. <laughs> <laughs> I too want to thank Case Western Law School and, and the Law Review for having us. Um, the only plausible re reason to ask me to be at this conference is that I was the primary author of the brief of the federalism scholars um, on the side of Windsor in um, the case. And we made a federalism argument for getting rid of DOMA. Um, and so I'm a little distressed and mystified to hear all the hating on federalism in the last <laughs> panel. Um, it's always nice to be equated with segregationists. Um, <laughs> Professor Marcus is in distinguished company. Linda Greenhouse made the same point on the op-ed page of the New York Times. I think the basic fallacy is in assuming that federalism arguments are over here and they're just separate. They're only enumerated powers arguments and equal protection arguments are over here and they don't have anything to do with each other. And the truth is that they can both be components of an argument and oftentimes they're gonna be more effective when they operate in that way. So for instance, the reference to, to state law as having a, a critical importance in Windsor do not stop after Justice Kennedy says, we're not going to decide this case on federalism grounds, by which he means the enumerated powers ground that was offered to him. It's critical throughout the opinion. He hardly ever says dignity or equality without also say, saying state law in the same sentence. So it's a duck. Um, and let me, let me make a, a couple points about why I think it's a very good duck. Um, you've, you've heard several powerful arguments for, you know, arguing that the same-sex marriage debate requires us to choose between incommensurable assumptions. So Professor Gallagher says that, that the absence of affirmation doesn't equate to a desire to harm. And, and, and I think in the abstract, that's true. Um, but federalism offers an answer to that argument because New York had chosen to affirm this marriage. And then the federal government comes in and tries to take apart, at least for federal purposes, that marriage. And that, I think, crosses the line to become a desire to harm. Similarly, um, Professor Gerges says you have to pick among incommensurable alternatives, incommensurable visions about what marriage is, and the Constitution is silent on that question. And oh, that may or may not be true, but New York law is not silent on that question. New York has made a decision first through the courts and then through the democratic processes of that state to adopt one of those definitions. And the question is whether federal government can come in and take apart that definition for purposes at least of federal law. And that, I would submit, is a question of federalism. Professor Marcus invokes 
Loving versus Virginia, and Loving versus Virginia is typically read as recognizing um, that marriage is a fundamental right for purposes of equal protection scrutiny, so that if you unequally allocate access to a fundamental right, that triggers strict scrutiny. But that only works if we agree on what the definition of marriage is in the first place, and we don't agree on the definition of marriage in the first place. At, at least many people don't agree. But New York had resolved that question, and it's critical that there is a baseline set by state law in these cases. And I think that's why these federalism arguments are, are so important in Windsor. And I think that's actually the ground that the court relied on. But I've written that article already. That's not what I'm here to talk about today. What I am here to talk about today is the argument that they didn't rely on in Windsor, but that is in, is in the air in Windsor. It was presented to them in Windsor, and particularly a, a single facet of that argument, which is that our argument about federalism triggered a response from DOMA's defenders that fed the federal government simply has a freestanding power to define the terms that it uses in federal statutes. And it doesn't have to be justified on enumerated powers grounds. That claim was made frequently and loudly. So for instance, Ed Whelan in the National Review Online thought that this definitions power was so obvious that arguments questioning DOMA on federalism grounds were absurd, badly confused, um, and I'm proud to say that I was the most badly confused of them all on this point. So that's the argument that I want to sketch out for you today, that there is no freestanding federal definitions power. This is an issue with continuing significance, because if, if Congress can just define important terms in the law in any way that it wants, that's going to have important regulatory effects. And if those are not constrained by the enumerated powers, then that's a, 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 a very disruptive possibility. So it'll help by canvassing three different enumerated powers arguments one might make for DOMA. One is that DOMA was regulatory, but it can be justified under the traditional enumerated powers like the Commerce Clause. Second argument was that we would acknowledge that DOMA had a regulatory effect, but justify it under the Necessary and Proper Clause as being an in aid of other federal statutes. And then third, we might just treat definitions as different. This is the argument I want to ultimately focus on. Definitions are just different. They don't need any kind of freestanding constitutional justification. So the enumerated powers point, I think, is, is tough to argue. You always start with the Commerce Clause, right? Lots of commercial regulation touches on marriage, but marriage itself is not a commercial activity. Weddings, on the other hand, I can report from experience, I got married last month, can be a quite commercial activity. <laughs> I, mean, I, I, I fear that the final tab on my wedding may have been sufficient to substantially affect interstate commerce. <laughs> um, but the actual definition of the marriage relationship, that is not a commercial activity. There is no federal enumerated power that reaches that. If, if you want to talk about Section 5 or something like that, we can do that in the, in the Q&A. Uh, what about the Necessary and Proper Clause? Now, as I read the current jurisprudence, and, and this may be somewhat controversial, I think that there are three requirements. That the use of the Necessary and Proper Clause is basically the use of an unenumerated means, right? You, you're doing something that the Constitution doesn't enumerate the power to do. It has to be, first of all, incidental to an enumerated end. So you can use an unenumerated means to an enumerated end under the Constitution. Second. The enumerated means has to be, the unenumerated means has to be plainly adapted to the unenumerated end. And third, it has to be proper, whatever we think proper means. So you could jump off the boat here and you could say, no, the necessary and proper clause is broader than that, McCulloch is broader than that, it's basically a rubber stamp. I wouldn't agree with that, but it doesn't really affect my core argument, which is simply, so if you think that, then you probably think you don't need a federal definitions power to justify DOMA. Well, that, that's fine. My argument is just that there is no freestanding federal definitions power beyond what you get under the Necessary and Proper Clause, however you read it. So incidental, um, you have to be employing an unenumerated means to an enumerated end. Now that will permit some federal regulation that constrains Marriage. So, for instance, the immigration anti-fraud statute says that the INS will refuse to recognize marriages that may be valid under state law, but that were entered into for the purposes of facilitating someone's entry into the country. Right? That is, is, is using an unenumerated means, which is monkeying around with marriage, to an enumerated end, which is regulating people coming in and out of the country. That is probably fine under the Necessary and Proper Clause, but that's not DOMA. 
it's the Defense of Marriage Act, for gosh sakes. It will be often be hard to tell whether a federal statute is really the, the tail, you know, the, the, the incidental tail, or the primary show the dog, right? But DOMA is the dog. You know, it, it, Congress is setting out to regulate marriage. They couldn't be clearer about that. It's not incidental to ERISA or something like that. Plainly adapted. This is a means ends fit test. Does DOMA fit its enumerated objective? And it's a tough argument to make when DOMA is modifying 1,100 different federal statutes at once. Our position in the brief was simply that a, a statute that modifies 1,100 different federal statutory schemes is plainly adapted to none of them. Right? Congress hasn't made any judgment that DOMA was necessary to make the tax code work better, to make ERISA work better. That would be a, a very tough argument to make and it's on any kind of global grounds. And there are plenty of, of examples where it's just absurd. So for instance, it's a federal crime to try to bribe the spouse of a federal official. What possible federal purpose does it serve to say, but oh, it's okay to bribe the same sex spouse of a, of a federal official, right? <laughs> Not plainly adapted. What about proper? It's hard to know what proper means. Maybe not much, but one plausible possibility is simply that it's not necessary and proper if you're interfering with the state's exercise of powers that we concede are reserved to them. And we argued in the brief that in many ways, defining marriage as different sex only for federal purposes actually interfered with the state's exercise of their powers to define marriage the way they wanted for their own purposes. And I'll come back to that point later on. Now, so if we can put aside the necessary and proper clause, the third possibility is that you just don't need a distinct constitutional basis for a definition. Definitions are different. Now, the more precise way to put this would be to say that definitions are to be plugged into other federal statutes. So all you need is a constitutional basis for the other federal statute, right? So all DOMA then adds to that argument is that you can define a term wholesale for all federal statutes at once, as well as retail, one statute at a time. And what I wanna stress is that argument only works if federal definitions have no independent regulatory effect, but they do have independent regulatory effects. So consider these hypotheticals, and then I'll come back to DOMA. One would be a federal definition of divorce that rejects no-fault divorce. One time, no-fault divorce was quite controversial. So imagine the havoc that that would reach on tax obligations, federal benefits, intellectual property rights, federal pension plans, right? I have a no-fault divorce. Can I remarry? I just did. Would I be guilty of bigamy under federal law? I've, I've been trying to figure out all afternoon if the Morrill Act is still in effect, because at one time there was a federal bigamy law, right? So that would be trouble. Right? Um, the point is that that situation would, first of all, deter divorce, period, which is a regulatory effect. Second, it would probably compel couples to try to prove fault in their, even if they lived in a no-fault state, just so that their divorce would be valid under both state and federal law, with all the, the trouble that fault-based divorce caused and caused us to move away with, from it in the first place. And then it would create very strong incentives for the states to return to a fault-based regime just to avoid these conflicts between state and federal law. This is why federal law takes state divorce law as it finds it and doesn't define divorce for itself. Second example, what about a, def a federal definition of property that is narrower than most state definitions? Um, so I don't know from property law, but here I think is an example. Um, you could impose the doctrine of avulsion, which is that when, you know, as a result of, of you know, tidal processes, land comes to exist adjacent to existing property at the waterline. Under the doctrine of avulsion, that belongs to people who own the seabed, um, but if you're in a state that didn't have avulsion, it would belong to the landowner who, who lives adjacently. So imagine the federal government imposes for federal purposes the doctrine of avulsion <coughs> so it doesn't belong to the adjacent property owner, but state law says it does, right? So you've got a property right that exists under state law, but not under federal law. The only point I wanna make is that that property right is worth less than something that is recognized by both state and federal law, which just goes to show that even though you've done this by a definition, you have really affected rights and obligations out in the world. Again, federal law generally takes state property law as it finds it, and there are very good reasons for that. Now, the second point about all this is that these regulatory effects of things like DOMA and potentially other federal definitions aren't confined to federal programs or federal personnel. So, first of all, state officials frequently administer 
federal programs and implement federal programs. And DOMA requires them to actually go against state law and refuse to provide benefits to people who under the state law that they are sworn to uphold would be considered to be married. And second of all, DOMA also interferes with the implementation and enforcement of state law itself. So, for instance, it undermines spousal support orders by making them unenforceable in bankruptcy. It wreaks havoc on state income tax schemes that are designed to piggyback on the federal definition of income. It increases the taxes that the state as employers pay when they extend health insurance to same-sex spouses. So all of this is just to say the federal definitions can't be distinguished from other federal laws. They have to stand or fall on the same constitutional basis as any other federal law. Many definitions can pass that test, but not a definition of something like marriage. Um, so what is the result if sometimes the federal government lacks constitutional power to define its terms? The result is simply that on some things, federal law has to take state law as it finds it. Now, a couple of points about that. First, it's worth noting that this is the norm in a number of areas, including marriage, even under DOMA, which didn't actually define marriage in the first place. It simply imposed a federal constraint on what marriages they would recognize. But federal law still took state law as it found it on questions like age limits, consanguinity, um, divorce, right? Notably, the sky did not fall for lack of a federal definition of marriage. More fundamentally, federal law just is interstitial in its nature. That is the insight of Henry Hart and 70 years of legal process thinking about federalism. Congress legislates against the background of state law, much as a state legislature legislates against the background of the common law. There are always gaps in federal law, and they are generally filled by reference to state law. Nothing to see here. Let me conclude by offering one reason why this federalism argument influences the equal protection argument. This is not the only way they work together, and the point I made at the beginning about how state law fills the gap by choosing between these incommensurable alternatives is a different argument. But here's another simpler point. No matter what level of scrutiny applies under the Equal Protection Clause, DOMA can only be defended against an equal protection challenge in terms of some governmental interest. So. The defenders of DOMA and the Supreme Court, Paul Clement and, and the Bipartisan Legal Advisory Group, the BLAG, they were very clear about what the interest is in DOMA. It's that the federal government has the same interest in articulating a substantive view of marriage, a moral view of marriage, that any state would have. And one clear payout of my argument here is that simply isn't true. The federal government might limit marriage, incidentally, in pursuit of some other federal purpose, but the core interest in defining marriage itself is an interest that the federal government simply doesn't have. That's game over for DOMA, but it is a federalism argument. Thanks. If, um, if it's all the same to everybody, I'm going to sit during this presentation. I strongly suspect that I'm the only World War II veteran in this room. <laughs> In fact, I know that I'm the only World War II. <laughs> you can thank me for my service later. Uh, I suspect I may also be the only World War II veteran in the university still actively teaching. Um, in any event, uh, let me begin by saying that uh, I'm just a backcountry tax law professor. And um, I don't know what I'm doing here among all these constitutional law luminaries and uh, political science luminaries. Uh, and I suspect it's because the, the um, uh, organizers of this symposium thought that, you know, there must be some tax aspects to, to the invalidation of DOMA. Uh, and let's get Gabinet to talk about them. <laughs> so uh, here I am among all these luminaries. Uh, well, uh, let, me, <clears throat> let me begin by saying that it is undeniably true that the tax laws, uh, <clears throat> I think, permeate virtually every nook and cranny of our lives. Uh, and it, it is also undeniably true that therefore uh, there are some tax consequences as a result of the invalidation of DOMA. Uh, let, me, let me also tell you that there are, in the, in the entire United States Code, there are 1,138 provisions in which marital status <coughs> uh, determines the right uh, and the availability of benefits. Um, 200 of those are in the Internal Revenue Code. <clears throat> so this is going to be a long talk. 
<laughs> no, 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 let me still your fears. <clears throat> uh, I have decided that what we had better do is to pick and choose um, and uh, to, um, uh, to hit only those things that are of uh, real importance, both to <clears throat> same-sex couples and from the perspective of the federal government, because some of these things will indeed affect the federal fisc to some extent. Um, let, me, uh, let me begin with something general, um, and that is that uh, because, because of some language in the Windsor case, uh, the Internal Revenue Service was presented with a dilemma uh, as, to, as to how to interpret the case, and that is, um, uh, that is because looking at the last sentence of the opinion, the very last sentence of the opinion, and even my old memory uh, allows me to commit this to memory. Um, Justice, Kennedy, Justice Kennedy says, this opinion and its holding is confined to those lawful marriages. That suggests a limitation. Um, uh, it's not overreaching. The service had to decide, internal revenue service had to decide, well, what exactly is the reach of, of uh, the Windsor case? Um, what are the limitations? What lawful marriages is Justice Kennedy talking about? And about <clears throat> uh, 10 or so lines up from that very last sentence, uh, there appears the following statement. The class to which DOMA directs its restrictions and restraints are those persons who are joined in same-sex marriages made lawful by the state. DOMA singles out a class of persons deemed by a state entitled to recognize uh, to recognize and protection, uh, to recognition and protection to enhance their own liberty. In other words, <clears throat> what are they talking about? They seem to be talking about a class of persons which s satisfy the factual pattern in, um, in, in Windsor, namely, a uh, same-sex couple married in a jurisdiction in which marriage was legal and who reside in a state in which the marriage is recognized. Seems to me that that's what this language is saying. Now, if that is the case, <clears throat> here's the dilemma for the service. Uh, what are we going to do? Are we going to interpret this to mean that um, we are to look at uh, the, uh, the law of the state of residence in order to figure out whether or not um, uh, we're going to apply federal tax law based on the law of the state of residence, which may or may not recognize uh, uh, the marriage? Or are we going to look at the law of the place of celebration. They're faced with the immediate choice of law problem. <clears throat> and it would make an enormous difference, of course. Uh, if, if indeed uh, they were to look at the, the uh, law of the state of residence in order to determine the application of, of the tax laws, it would create an enormous disuniformity in the application of those laws. In other words, if you live in the state of Ohio, um, <clears throat> it may very well be that uh, maybe your marriage is not recognized and therefore you can't file a joint return. Uh, if, you live in, if you were married in the state of Massachusetts and live in Massachusetts, um, then uh, you can file a joint return because you are now spouses. So it would have created this uniformity. Well, the Internal Revenue Service, well aware of that, um, issued a, a um, revenue ruling in, uh, on August 29, 2013, <coughs> 2013, revenue ruling 2013-17, in which it said that <clears throat> it is opting to follow the law of the state of celebration of the marriage, uh, which means, from the perspective of same-sex married couples, that <clears throat> they, they can move freely about the country, and they can be sure that wherever they reside, even in Texas, that um, their, their, marriage, uh, their marriage will be recognized for federal tax law purposes. Uh, from the point of view of the government, it means that we now have uniformity that those marriages will be recognized everywhere, at least for federal tax law purposes. State law, that's another issue. <clears throat> well, um, so having decided that, let me move on to something substantive. Um, <clears throat> and I'm going to make a sort of iconoclastic statement. Um, contrary to what everybody else has been saying here today, uh, Windsor is a tax case. <laughs> Um, the, the specific issue in Windsor was this. Is Thea Spire, who was the same-sex spouse of Edie Windsor, 
is that estate entitled to a federal estate tax marital deduction? That was the issue. And all this constitutional stuff, <laughs> and all the stuff about federalism, and all the stuff about meaning of marriage, um, all of that was, uh, had, to be, had to be determined in order to answer the tax question. <laughs> is, this, is, is the estate or is the estate not entitled to a marital deduction? Now, let me explain for those of you who are, who are not tax aficionados, that the, <laughs> and I expect there are many of you, um, <laughs> uh, the, um, uh, the federal estate tax provides a, a deduction, an unlimited deduction, for property that passes from a decedent to that decedent's spouse. Okay? Unlimited deduction. Now, um, if, if indeed uh, Windsor and, and Spire were spouses, um, as it now turns out that they are under the, under the, uh, uh, the decision of Windsor, um, they are entitled to that marital deduction. Uh, the answer to the tax question is that yes, the, the estate is now entitled to a marital deduction. What that means for same-sex couples <coughs> is that uh, in the event of the death of one of them, uh, property that passes from that decedent spouse to the surviving spouse will be, uh, will be, there will be a marital deduction available for the, for the value of the property that passes to the surviving spouse. That was not possible under pre-Windsor. Now, there's uh, another estate tax issue, uh, and one uh, that will affect uh, same-sex couples also, and that is that um, if, uh, well, let me go back a minute. Uh, again, uh, not only is there a mar unlimited marital deduction available, but everybody, everybody has a $5 million exemption from federal estate tax. Now, uh, suppose that we have a, a, um, a, a same-sex couple that um, <coughs> married, same sex, legally married, same-sex couple, and um, uh, there is a $5 million estate. The decedent has a $5 million estate. The decedent leaves $3 million to other heirs, not spouse, other heirs, three million bucks. Two million bucks goes to the surviving spouse. Now what that means is that there will be no estate tax. Um, the, the marital deduction, the two million dollar marital deduction will apply, and because only three million dollars passed to other heirs, um, there will be no tax. As far as the surviving spouse is concerned, there is a, there is a portability provision. Uh, and what, what that portability provision means is that the amount of the exemption, the $5 million exemption that was not used in this case, would be transferred to the surviving spouse. Uh, that's what we mean by portability. And that means that the surviving spouse is now going to have $7 million of exemption. You'll be able to pass $7 million bucks. That basically is the estate tax effect of all this. Now, <clears throat> what does this mean from the point of view of the, the federal government in terms of, of uh, the budget? Nothing. <laughs> uh, because, <clears throat> do you know how many, how many taxable estates were filed in this country in, in 2012? 3,600. Uh, that's it. I'm not sure about, about the, the uh, uh, the number of, of married couples, but I, I suspect uh, that there were about 25,000 25, estate tax returns filed, or somewhere between 25,000 and 30,000. Out of those, 3,600 were taxable estates. That is to say, a taxable estate in excess of the $5 million exemption. That means there aren't going to be a heck of a lot of people who are going to be filing estate tax returns anyway. Whether they're, whether they're same sex or heterosexual or single or what, uh, because there are not very many people in this country, period, who have, an estates, in, who have estates in excess of $5 million. And <clears throat> certainly not very many who have estates in excess of $7 million, uh, or in the case of, of a married couple, $10 million, because each of them have a $5 million exemption. So I think that the, the um, uh, the, the impact on the Treasury here is going to be basically nil. Well, uh, let's turn from the estate tax to um, some income tax issues because mainly my focus here is really the income tax. 
Um, first of all, uh, what about amended returns? Uh, after all, <coughs> uh, a, um, uh, a taxpayer is entitled to file an amended return uh, within a certain period of time. There's a statute of limitations, a certain period of time from the date of the filing of the, re of the return uh, or the due date of the return, whichever is, whichever is uh, the greater. Um, and uh, is it not now possible or will it be possible for, <coughs> um, for uh, uh, married, legally married, uh, same-sex couples to file an amended return for the three-year period, uh, for the three-year period during which the the uh, uh, income tax return, their income tax return, is open, okay, um, and and to claim uh, what will be <coughs> certain benefits of, of being married, namely joint filing privileges, okay, joint filing privileges, and the Internal Revenue Service has said yes, that they will allow this to happen, that they will allow an amended return to be filed for the three-year open period. <clears throat> now, what about prior to that? Uh, don't know. Uh, and the Internal Revenue Service has not spoken on this issue, and we don't know what the situation is with respect to uh, amending returns that were filed prior to the three-year limitations period. So that remains uh, an open question. Um, Perhaps the most important change for same-sex marriage couple is going to be um, their filing status, filing status. Uh, when you're married, <clears throat> what happens is that you are allowed to file returns in two ways. Uh, you can either file a joint return with your spouse or you can file uh, as married but filing separately, okay? Those are your two options. Now, before Windsor, uh, what what uh, married couples had to do, what same-sex couples had to do, because they were not considered spouses under DOMA, uh, was that they, they had to file single returns, returns as single taxpayers. Now, they have the option to file either jointly or as married filing separately. Uh, whether or not this works to their benefit or not depends on whether they're going to have a marriage penalty or whether they're going to have a marriage bonus and that depends on their income situation. <clears throat> if they have, there is no disparity in their incomes. Let's say we have um, a, a married couple and each one earns $100,000 a year. Um, it is disadvantageous for those people to file jointly um, because what will happen is that more of their income is going to be in a higher bracket and therefore they will suffer a, a marriage penalty. Um, it is, they can file, they can file married but filing separately, but that also is not as good as filing singly, simply because the way the brackets are constructed, the width of the brackets, um, uh, if, if we're talking about $100,000 of taxable income, uh, for single taxpayer, some of that income would be, a small part of that income would be in a 28% bracket. Um, the larger part of that income would be in a 25% bracket. But now, if you, if you, those, those people file jointly, more of their income is going to be in the 28% bracket and they're gonna have a marriage penalty. Now, how this is gonna work out for the government, who knows? Um, I suspect that what I said about the estate tax applies here, that the impact actually will be minor, minimal, why? There are about 50, 51 million returns filed in this country. Uh, the latest figures available are, I'm afraid, 2004. I can't go later than that. Those are the latest figure available. In 2004, there were 50, there were 51.1 million returns filed as married. Out of those 51 million returns, 2.5 million were filed as married filing separately. In other words, the bulk of people who are married, and this is going to include, and I suspect that we can project this onto same-sex married couples, uh, the bulk of those people are going, to, are going to file joint returns because they will find that they have a marriage bonus rather than a marriage penalty uh, by filing, by filing uh, jointly because of the disparity in their income. Um, which means, again, that things are not gonna change pretty much for what they are now. <clears throat> 
uh, so that there is going to be kind of a, a minimal effect uh, on the on the treasury. Of course, from the perspective from the perspective of, of the same sex couple, uh, heck, if you're going to have a marriage bonus, uh, that's great. Uh, so the from their perspective, fine thing. Uh, let's take a look at some of, some of these other um, uh, substantive provisions. Uh, let's talk about tax credits, uh, the earned income tax credit. Uh, the value of the uh, earned un income tax credit uh, for some of the uh, for some dual earner low income uh, couples, um, I think, is going to decrease uh, because of the phase out. Uh, when they when they uh, combine their incomes, uh, they are going to get into the phase out range, and uh, and indeed uh, the the availability of the credit may be eliminated altogether. The uh, child and dependent care credit. Um, uh, the unfortunate part of this is, is that that credit is limited to uh, no more than the income of the lower earner. So if one spouse has no income, there's going to be a failure to qualify. Sure. Um, what about the child tax, uh, child tax credit? Uh, again, phase out of, of, uh, at certain levels, namely $110,000 for married filing jointly, 75,000 for singles. Uh, the phase out threshold uh, for those married people is less than two times that for marrieds. So again, uh, this is not gonna work to the advantage of, of those people. Um, and I think maybe <clears throat> the, the final thing that I will say has to do with employee benefits. And the reason, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, the reason I chose this to talk about is because uh, the non-taxability of <clears throat> employer-sponsored health insurance, that is uh, uh, insurance furnished by an employer, uh, the value of which is not taxed to the employee. Uh, under sec I hate to throw sections at you, but that's section 106 of the Internal Revenue Code. Um, that costs the Treasury <clears throat> $300 billion annually. That has an impact. Now, what happens after Windsor <clears throat> is that um, those, those people are going to be able to cover their spouses. Costs are going to be increased. Um, and what is more, if you are in a cafeteria plan, uh, and, and uh, most employer-provided employer, employer provided insurance are in the form of cafeteria plans, where the, uh, the employer says, hey, you can choose among a number of, of uh, health plans. <clears throat> and um, uh, we'll, we'll uh, uh, pay for them out of you. We'll reduce your salary and we'll pay for them. The value, the value of that uh, is not taxed either. Now that means that we're going to have more spouses. We are going to have uh, more same-sex spouses who are now going to be entitled to opt into these or their, uh, their, their spouses who are employed are going to be able to opt into these plans and that's going to up the ante in terms of the cost to the federal treasury. So. Yeah, there are <clears throat> a bunch of things that will matter. There are a bunch of things that will not. I suspect that the only thing which will really matter in a large way um, are these health care benefits. For the rest, I think the effect is going to be minimal. Thank you. Did all of our uh, panelists stayed within their allotted time, so we have uh, about 15 minutes or so. Uh, for questions, uh, do we have questions for the panel? One in the back there. Uh, Professor Gabinet, if me. a couple <laughs> gets married, uh, lives in Ohio, gay couple, um, goes to New York, gets married, comes back, they can file a joint return, correct, under federal. Now, what about the state of Ohio, which generally uses that federal return to impose the state tax? Yeah, that's an interesting question. <laughs> um, <laughs> oh, <coughs> Ohio has an income tax that piggybacks onto the federal. Okay? Now, if they file a joint return uh, for federal purposes, they can file a separate return. <coughs> file. Um, uh, and uh, since Ohio does not recognize their marriage, I strongly suspect that what those people will do will be to file single returns. 
Professor Wilson, um, wondering why, uh, yeah, you mentioned the uh, difficulties that the gay movement is going to face in the basically red states. Uh, but why should the gay movement not just push the Supreme Court to impose uh, same-sex marriage nationwide and push Congress to adopt ENDA? Uh, and uh, mm -hmm. why should it accept any uh, religious right to discriminate? So, you know, my claims are obviously not about the judiciary. I don't know what will happen with those things. And I can imagine that many people will push precisely there. And you can see that that's a neat and easy, clean way to go. You don't have to bargain on their side either. But if they're left to bargain in state law, then I think the motivation for the same-sex marriage advocates is to secure that civil right for themselves today. Right, so they benefit from those points of equipoise as well, um, and uh, you know I showed the vote counts very quickly, but it's likely from interviews together with those vote counts that had those religious liberty protections not been ponied up, they would not have had marriage equality that year. So I think they're motivated to bargain. Obviously, if what you want is marriage equality, you're better off getting it from the courts because you don't have to mess with any of that, right? But if you're stuck with the messiness and you can't predict what those courts are going to do, and I think some earlier panels suggest that they're going to continue to punt as long as they can punt, right, then it could be good to bargain. Uh, this is to Professor Wilson. Um, just thinking about uh, wartime objectors uh, for religious reasons and separating who was a genuine objector and who was um, someone who just wanted to get out of wartime service. Um, how would you distinguish between the two with uh, religious protections for individuals? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Thank you. Um, you know, at least the state laws that I've been involved with or the proposals I've been involved with build in a sincerity test like the military objector. Notice that the military objector didn't get a complete pa pass, right? They're gonna do ambulance service or something else. Um, you, you might say that this kind of conscience objection is really of a different kind. It's uh, the right to be allowed to step off as opposed to get in the way of something. Um, and it's built around a thick conception of um, what it means to facilitate a marriage that you religiously object to. And just to be clear, the objections that I've argued for are qualified by hardship to same-sex couples. So that if there was a finite pie, um, to, to draw on the military analogy, if there was no one else left to fight, you're going to be stuck fighting, right? And if there's no one else to process the paperwork for a same-sex marriage, same-sex couple who's been told by the state that they have the right to marry, then you're going to have to do that. On the other hand, in the classic case, and I have a piece that talks about clerks in Massachusetts state offices, right, because it's the earliest, longest history we have with same-sex coupling in the United States. Lots of those offices had things like 11 clerks. And after the pent-up demand, right, the first run on marriage licenses after the recognition of this right was exhausted, what you saw was something like 2% of all the applications were same-sex couples, right? So imagine that you have faith, hope, charity, and efficiency as your four clerks, right? And the only one who objects is faith, right? Let faith step aside. Hope and charity can do, or efficiency can do the application, right? Who cares? And in fact, my um, empirical in interviews with the clerk's offices show that those clerk's offices are working at sort of maximum capacity. So what that really means is if you let faith step aside, she's not going to be out back smoking cigarettes or eating bonbons. She's going to do the next piece of work. In other words, she's going to be the guy who does the dog license, right, instead of the same-sex marriage license or whatever work that office happens to do. So, you know, I think there's a, a you know, a real struggle sometimes to think about how can we have both of these things, marriage equality and religious liberty. I don't think they have to always be in tension. I think there are going to be cases where we have to decide what we're going to do in a hard case, and you focused on it right off the bat. But at any rate. Uh, Professor Wilson, just I guess somewhat to, to follow up on that. To what extent do you think uh, at the federal level the Religious Freedom Restoration Act and 
uh, state refers where they are, in fact, equivalent, uh, do the work uh, for uh, uh, protecting religious liberty to the extent you think it needs to be protected, or and to what extent do you need separate legislation? So can I follow uh, Professor Gabinet and say, well, gee, you know, I'm not a con law scholar. Um, <laughs> and say, you know, because that's not really been where I've been working at. But I will say something that's interesting um, about Hawaii, for example. So there's now a claim that's made about religious exemptions in different states that the background exemptions in state law, like the Miss Murphy kind of exemptions to the housing acts for religious objectors to sort of decide, you know, not to open their house uh, to certain people or whatever, that, that those do the work already. Um, and so you don't need an express exemption. And I'm just not sure that's true. So for example, uh, the group of scholars that I've been working with was looking at whether religious counseling, for example, was already encompassed, the Baptist marriage retreat was already encompassed by um, existing protections in the um, Fair Housing Act in Hawaii. And I don't think it is. Others in my group thought it might be. But here's the point. It's going to get litigated if you don't decide it now, right? And the last thing we want to do, pardon to the law students, is create litigation. This is stupid. This is not a good use of our money. So if the legislature intends to cut that off, they should just cut it off and not be gutless about it. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm surprised that nobody asked me about um, what happens in, uh, what are the consequences of winter when there's a, a same-sex divorce? Um, and uh, there are serious consequences. Um, uh, what, it, what it means uh, now is that uh, the entire regime that governs divorce uh, for heterosexual couples now applies to same-sex couples. That means that we have, uh, we, we're going to have uniform treatment of alimony, uh, taxable to the recipient, deductible by the payor, and then you have uh, uh, the, uh, the question of the transfer of appreciated property uh, in, the, in the marriage settlement. Uh, section 1041 applies there. And Section 1041 says that no gain or loss will be recognized on the transfer of property from one spouse to another uh, incident to a, to a spouse or a spouse incident to a divorce. So uh, you can transfer appreciated property uh, uh, to a spouse without having, without having to recognize any, any uh, tax on the gain. However, what that means is that the spouse who succeeds to that property is going to take the low basis of the transferor. Uh, and that becomes a bargaining chip. You want me to pay those taxes ultimately, you give me more money for alimony. Can I just ask, are, are they assuming that you'd have to get the divorce from the state that celebrated the marriage? Well, here's what happens. <coughs> if, if, you, <laughs> if you live, if you're married in Massachusetts and you live in Texas, forget it. You can't get a divorce in Texas. And that is also true in Nebraska, and it's also true in Pennsylvania now. Uh, in other words, they don't believe in the inherent equitable jurisdiction of courts down there. Uh, yeah, so they, they can't get a divorce in the first place in, in those states. Question in the back, Professor Marcus. I'm going to duck the duck question <laughs> because I have another question for um, Ms. Wilson about the legislation <coughs> that you're talking about. I haven't really studied it carefully, but I have a couple of questions. One is um, some of the legislation that seems to be exempting individuals, some also is so broad that it would cover organizations and businesses and carve out exceptions for them. Um, and the cases I'm familiar with, the, the, the cake example that was mentioned earlier today, that was in the context of a public accommodations law. And it was a public accommodations law that included, I believe, sexual orientation as one of the protected categories. So. It sounds like what you're talking about is carving out exceptions to civil rights laws for businesses and organizations as well as individuals. And so my first question is, how would a court decide? How is that to be decided legally what, what a, an organization or business's religious beliefs are? Which, I mean, usually individuals have religious beliefs, not organizations. So um, is there any uniformity in how you define that in your proposed legislation? And my other question is a little more philosophical, constitutional, historic in nature, which is that traditionally, at the time of Loving versus Virginia, there were religious exempt, there were religious objections to interracial marriage. So some of the foundations for 
miscegenation laws were actually, we think that the Bible says you can't marry another race. <coughs> so how would your laws, if they're written broadly to say you can't be forced to recognize a marriage you don't believe in, what would stop a business from saying, well, I'm not going to um, make a cake for an interracial couple? Would that be okay under your legislation? And if you're writing it more specifically to avoid that problem, why are you distinguishing race from sexual orientation? Okay. Um, no, those are great questions. So let me start with the organizations versus individuals. You're right. You know, so there's jack it's, it's actually a sticking point for legislation, especially in the states where there's al already a promise of, of participation in the world, right? Um, based on sexual orientation. But you have to remember that when these laws sort of are enacted, same-sex marriage itself is enacted, doesn't just sort of drop from the sky into a blank slate. It drops into an existing legal substrate, as you accurately described, at least in those 21 states, right? In the next 29, that's not going to be true. It will be a blank slate. I'll come back to that in just a second. But in the first 21, I think it does bother and should bother many of the legislators that this somehow looks like a rollback, right? And I think the answer to that is it's not a rollback, that those original statutes were about burgers and taxis and large apartments. In other words, they were, so for example, my kid was working at Hardee's. And if he was at Hardee's and he wouldn't serve somebody a burger, there's really no moral content to that burger, right? There's no other way to explain the refusal to do that other than animus towards the person that you're being asked to serve. Now, I would argue that marriage is of a different kind, that, that it has, Sharif, I don't know where he went, but you know, has had a religious meaning for uh, centuries. Many people have religious views about it, and not only do they have a religious view about it, they have a re religious view about whether they can facilitate it. And then I think a refusal by Arlene Flowers or someone else to say no only to that. Notice that in Arlene Flowers, they had served the couple for a decade. They didn't have any problem with gay people. The problem was being asked to facilitate their marriage qua marriage. So I think the, the laws that pre-exist in the states where they do pre-exist were really about commercial, truly commercial activities and not this sort of different thing that I think has an intimate character. The statutes that I'm talking about are carefully circumscribed only to the celebration or the solemnization of that marriage, or in some limited instances, a quote, recognition of the marriage. I'd be happy to show it to you. So, and then, and cause I think, but that would be easier to talk about um, together. And the other point that you raised was religious objections to, for example, an interracial marriage. And um, yeah, so this objection, the, the kind of objection that we're talking about would potentially encompass that. Now, I personally don't think that there's any good religious explanation for saying why you're not, you know, why a white person and a black person shouldn't be able to marry. When I was married, I was in an interracial marriage, right? And I understand from Bill Eskridge and lots of people, right, that religious objections were in fact used, right, to hold up things like that. I would hope that a sincerity test, like we were talking about earlier, would screen all that nonsense out, but maybe it wouldn't, okay? If it would not, and a legislator who wants to get stuck on the race question can, I think, easily parse that off, and we talk about a sentence in the, in the letter that just says nothing, you know, herein provided would change anything with respect to race. Now, I understand that you probably want same-sex sexual orientation or race to be treated the same, but let me just say one thing about that. Race has divided our country in a way that I'm not sure sexual orientation has, right? We had a civil war. We have constitutional amendments. It has infused so much of our society and our history that I think it would be plausible to say, gee, you know, we want to do this for objectors, but we got to be sure that, that, that interracial marriages, that, that the stigma of somebody saying no to that would just be so awful, the, the social message. Now, I think your bigger point is they should be treated the same, right? And so let me talk about that for one second. Go back to the Fair Housing Act, the thing that I skipped over, Mrs. Murphy, right, is there. You'll remember Mrs. Murphy, maybe, right? Senator Walter Mondale gets up on the floor of the Senate and imagines this woman, Miss Murphy, who does not want black people to live in her house, right? He imagines her 
to be a racist. And why do they exempt Miss Murphy? Because they actually cared about the bigger goal. So they were not going to be able to pass the Fair Housing Act without an exemption for her. By the way, it's not really used so much for race today. It's used by religious objectors. Generally, people who don't want people in the next room having hinky sex, and what they mean by that is any kind of sex, right? Or any sex outside of marriage, right? And I don't think you and I disagree about the end result. Can we live in a world where the Miss Murphys basically don't want to say that they're racist? Can we get to a world where we're colorblind? And I think the answer is, if we don't make a religious martyr out of Miss Murphy today, we're more likely to live in that world, right? And that's the reason that you don't see people using that really around race as much as these other things. Time for one, one final question, and then I think we're going to have to uh, turn it over to, to Dean Etten for some closing remarks. Uh, this is a partly a federal state relationship question, partly a benefits question, piggybacking off of what some of Professor Gabinet said. Uh, it was recently noted in the New York Times that there are a few states, Texas most notably, where National Guard um, troops uh, who now receive full benefits of same-sex couples are required to drive to military installations, for example, Fort Hood, in order to fill out the paperwork, to receive their benefits. Um, now, I know we were sort of punted the issue about, well, if you're married in Ohio, uh, married in Massachusetts, live in Ohio, what's the tax implications? But more broadly, with, with, other, with other benefits that are federal, but there is perhaps some state relationships involved, could there be then you know, ru uh, rules coming out from the federal government that then bump up against the states, and we're going to have a bit of a, a conflict and maybe even a reckoning point of what's going to rule the day? This is directed to me. Are all closing up? Oh, oh okay. Um, <clears throat> there are there are all sorts of things that are going to be affected other than taxes as a result, and the the Internal Revenue Service is not the only agency that is have that's going to have to decide exactly what the reach of, of uh, Windsor is, uh, and those agencies are going to do it one by one until such time as we have something more definitive. Is the question whether state officials at a more convenient location could be compelled to let them fill out the forms there? If, that, if that's the question, then I think the answer is under the anti-commandeering doctrine, as long as it is optional whether the states participate in the program overall, the, the feds can impose certain conditions on it, which might include cooperation. Well, the... the um, part of the context of the National Guard one, when asked about this, there were certain members of the National Guard in Texas who asked about this. The response was, well, Texas prohibits us from recognizing your union on Texas property, but if you appear in Fort Hood, federal property, then we can recognize you. Yeah, I think so. people are confused. All righty, well, please join me in thanking this panel. And, uh, I'll just make one, one quick editorial comment. The, the uh, Professor Young's uh, duck uh, uh, amicus brief, which I will admit I was a signatory to, uh, was cited by Justice Kennedy's opinion. So that might have, have some role in whether or not we think it was a duck or a giraffe or a swan or whatever. Anyway, I will uh, turn the podium over to um, uh, Dean Etten, who will have some closing remarks. OK, this has been a really terrific program. And I think the first thing I want to do is ask if we can have a Round of applause for all of our speakers today. <laughs> and now I realize I am standing between you and the refreshments, so <laughs> let me be as brief as possible. Um, I want to tie up a, a couple of loose ends. Uh, the first thing that I want to point out is Professor Gabinet asked, How did he get on this program? And um, I'm the academic dean. Everything in this place is my fault. Um, <laughs> That's true. And, and, and just, just for the record, uh, pr one of the things that I do as academic dean is uh, to make the schedule. Uh, and for years, Professor Gabinet has been threatening to have my degree revoked, my college degree revoked, because his daughter-in-law is the president of the place where I went to college. So I have now gotten him into the moot courtroom to do some sort of a formal talk so we can 
take up whether I put my degree I'll at take risk. this up with you later. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Now, um, I also want to, to uh, say something about Sharif Gerges, who had to leave to get home. Um, I want to thank him in particular. Um, he was not originally going to be on the program. We originally had engaged uh, uh, Robert George, a very distinguished professor at Princeton, uh, and he was in all the publicity and good to go until about three weeks ago um, when he had back surgery. Um, we talked a little more. It turns out that Professor George, although he's making a, a very good recovery, was not in shape to come. Uh, Sharif Gerges is one of Professor George's co-authors and he graciously agreed to, to come in at the last second. So I think we really are owe him a particular debt of gratitude. Um, now, we've had today uh, an eclectic mix of discussion uh, about tax law, family law, constitutional law, demography, political science, lots of unresolved questions, but I think lots of really good insights. The presentations that we have heard today will provide the basis for the Law Review Symposium issue, and I'm not gonna put you all on the spot, although I will tell you that it will be, I am confident that the issue will be out this summer. Uh, I, Last year's symposium issue actually appeared online the day before graduation, so that is, that's something to aim for, but it, this will be a really good issue, um, and uh, I'm looking forward to it. The last thing I want to do is to, add, to recognize the two editors who were most responsible for the success of today's program. The first is Yelena Grinberg, who's the symposium editor. Stand up and bow. <laughs> And the other is the editor-in-chief, uh, Catherine Shaw Mikelski. Uh, and I actually want you to come on. Come on, uh, come on down, because uh, you, you're the editor-in-chief. You're going to close the show. And okay, <laughs> thank you very much for everything, folks. Well, as Dean Enton said, I'm Kat Mikelski, and I'm the editor-in-chief of Law Review. And again, as he said, we're standing in the way between sitting here, which has been a, a really long but very rich and illuminating day, um, and the reception. So I'll be brief. I just want to say a few words of thanks on behalf of Law Review. Um, we want to thank, again, the speakers for traveling and for coming here and generating such great discussion. Um, this has been something that we've all really, really enjoyed, and we're looking forward to publishing it, hopefully before the summer. We're shooting for the spring, but, but we're really looking forward to it. And also thank you, Professor Kahn, um, for acting as a discussant for this, for our publication as well. Um, and I want to thank our moderators, including our advisor, Dean Enton. You guys have been wonderful as far as facilitating and organizing this. Um, and your support means a lot to us, so thank you. Um, and finally, Yelena, again, we can't say enough. You've worked tirelessly since last spring to make this come together. And I think it's been a, a very successful program, so thank you. And then finally, thank you all for joining us today. Um, we couldn't have had such a successful conversation without all of you sitting here um, and it means a lot to us and we hope that you've enjoyed it as much as we have and with that I will say that we have a reception outside in the rotunda and we hope you all will join us there. Thank you.